Welcome back to Creepy Cassetti, your place for horror in reality and beyond. I'm your hostie. If this is your type of content, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and the notification bell so you'll know every time I drop a new video, and let's get right into it. I have to say, I do really love Halloween. I love the babies and pets in their little costumes, the creative expressions people bring to their attire and surroundings. I love the smell of the crisp fall air, and I also have one hell of a sweet tooth, and I think the idea of free candy is just great. But Halloween has had its fair share of horrifying events, and I decided to compile a short list of five of those events for you all today. I have to give another fair warning. Some of these events are very dark and could be considered triggering. Viewer discretion is advised. The Disappearance of Little Stephen Damon The afternoon of October 31st, 1955, Marilyn Damon took her two children, Stephen and Pamela, to a local store in their new home of East Meadow, New York, where her husband, Jerry Damon, had just been stationed at the local Air Force Base. She left Stephen, who was only only two and a half at the time, and seven-month-old Pamela just outside the store, asking Stephen to keep an eye on his little sister. Marilyn was in the store for about ten minutes, and when she returned, both her children were born. Pamela was found just a few blocks away, still in her stroller, but Stephen was not. While some leads did come in, most notably one from an opportunistic Queens College student who bribed the Damons three separate times, claiming payment would return their son safely, his actual abductor was never found. The Trick or Treat Murder At 11 p.m. on October 31st of 1957 in the city of Sun Valley, California, Peter and Betty Fabiano's bedtime routine was interrupted by a knock on the door. Thinking it was just some late-night trick-or-treaters, Peter headed to the door, a bowl of candy in hand. He was met by an individual wearing a domino mask, black face paint, blue jeans, and a khaki jacket, and red gloves. And from what Betty told the police, a person that sounded like a man imitating a woman. The murder weapon was a 38 caliber pistol hidden by a brown paper bag. Peter was, for the most part, a law-abiding citizen. The only charge he ever incurred was for bookmaking. Otherwise, he was a well-to-do hairdresser and ex-marine who operated two salons in the San Fernando Valley of California. So at first, police were at a loss. It wasn't like he was someone who had enemies or someone who regularly tangled with the criminal underworld. But somehow, the trail led back to Joan Rabel, a freelance photographer who worked a brief stint in one of Fabiano's salons. During her time working there, she and Betty Fabiano became friends. Their friendship really blossomed when Betty moved in with Joan during her brief separation with Peter. But when Betty decided to return home, Peter would not allow her to have any contact with Joan. When Joan was questioned, her continued response was that she had not pulled the trigger, and she tried to throw the cops off of her trail by saying her car had been in the driveway all night. An anonymous tip soon led the police to a department store lockbox that contained the murder weapon. Some ballistics testing and a scan of local gun shop registries led the police to Goldine Pizer. Pizer was a sniveling mess during her questioning and it didn't take much coaxing for her to give up the entire confession. Joan had been the plot divisor, having spent months convincing Goldine that Peter was this evil, vile, abusive individual, even though Goldine and Peter had never actually met. The night of the murder, Joan borrowed a car from her friend Margaret Barrett. She drove Goldine to the Fabiano's house where she, with trembling hands, executed Peter before returning to Barrett's car with Joan as the villainous chauffeur. Pizer said that she had been mesmerized by Joan, and as our result, she pled insanity, while Joan continued to plead not guilty. The two women copped a plea deal of second-degree murder and spent the rest of their lives in prison. The murder of Timothy O'Brien. Halloween night, 1974, eight-year-old Timothy O'Brien, his five-year-old sister Elizabeth, and their two friends from church, siblings Mark and Kimberly Bates, set out to the posh neighborhood of Pasadena, California. They were accompanied by Timothy and Elizabeth's father, Ronald O'Brien. What seemed like another magical night of trick-or-treating ended tragically when Timothy was rushed to Southmore Hospital with convulsions, vomiting, and foaming at the mouth. The boy was in tears from the pain of his condition. Not long after making it to the hospital, Timothy died suddenly and violently. Father Ronald O'Brien appeared to be in great despair, telling the police that Timothy had asked for one more piece of candy before going to bed. He was given a pixie stick and proclaimed that the treat was bitter. Ronald even said he bought the boy a glass of Kool-Aid to wash away the taste, and a few minutes later, the vomiting began. The pixie stick was the murder weapon, as it had been laced with cyanide. Police canvassed the area in the early morning hours, waking up locals and checking in on their children. They were trying to tie together some clues and get an idea of who would want to hurt California's most vulnerable residents. A few days later, Timothy 
he was laid to rest. His father sang a solemn tune at his funeral, but his behavior was starting to rub police the wrong way. They thought he was a little too calm for someone who had just lost a child, but they weren't going to jump to the conclusion that this grieving father was the cause of his son's demise. A few days later, Ronald O'Brien rode along with the officers and pointed out a house along the route where he stated the owner of the house handed him five pixie sticks. Four of the pixie sticks were handed out to Timothy, Elizabeth, and the Bates siblings, and the last one was given to a Whitney Parker, an 11-year-old boy who used his church connections with the family to get Ronald to handle the treat. None of the other four children were harmed, having not had the chance to consume the sticks. Police questioned the home's owner and found that his alibi was airtight. The night of Halloween, he had been working at the Hobby Airport Halloween night as an air dispatcher. When his alibi checked out, the police started really looking into Ronald. What they found out about Ronald was that the man had a series of financial issues, had submitted some fake insurance claims, and while Ronald was an optician, he had a history of habitual job hopping. He'd even boasted to some family friends that he would come into money before year's end. A Galena Park insurance agent contacted the police to tell them that Ronald had paid cash for two life insurance policies of $20,000 for Rogue Timothy and Elizabeth. Another insurance agent, Robert Ballou Jr., had talked Ronald into buying two smaller policies on the children that would pay out $25,000 once the children reached 23 years old. The evidence continued to mount. Friends even came forward to inform the police that Ronald had asked how much cyanide it would take to kill a person. Detective Sergeant David Mulliken interrogated Ronald. He changed his story multiple times and was caught up in multiple lies. Ronald O'Brien was convicted on June 3rd, 1975 after 45 minutes of deliberation and it took just another 70 minutes to sentence the filicidal man to death. Ronald's lawyers attempted to overturn the conviction multiple times unsuccessfully and O'Brien was executed by lethal injection on March 31st, 1984 at the state penitentiary in Huntsville, Texas. Make it known. The murder of Shirley Lynette Ledford. Halloween night, 1979. 16-year-old Shirley Ledford, who went by Lynette, was hitchhiking back to her home in Burbank, California after a Halloween party. She was picked up by two men, Roy Norris and Lawrence Bittaker, better known as the Toolbox Murderers. Lynette would be their final victim. The two men committed four other murders of underage girls in the Los Angeles County area during a five-month span in 1979. They were called the Toolbox Murderers because they carried a toolbox and used its contents to torture and murder their victims. Lynette had been kidnapped, raped, tortured with a screwdriver, and eventually strangled with a clothes hanger. Her brutal murder was caught on tape by the men and used as evidence to put them away. Her cries and pleas for mercy were so gut-wrenching to the jurors that some cried or had to leave the courtroom. Norris entered a guilty plea to avoid the death penalty and testified against Bittaker. Bittaker was sentenced to death. Norris was sentenced to 45 years to life in prison and died on February 25th of 2020. Due to California's legal challenges with the death penalty, Bittaker ended up dying on death row December 13th of 2019. Explosion at the Indiana Fairgrounds Coliseum. On Halloween of 1963, many people gathered in the Coliseum of the Indiana Fairgrounds to enjoy an ice skating show. The room was unventilated and it filled with fumes from a rusty gas tank. Fumes were sparked by an electric popcorn maker and caused a massive explosion. The 40-foot wall of flame blasted through the south side seats. Witnesses remember seeing chairs, body parts, and other debris fly through the air. 74 people died from their injuries. 54 died on the scene while the other 20 died later of their injuries. Still another 400 people were injured by the explosion. Nursing and medical students had to be bought in to help with the survivors. They created a makeshift morgue on the ice floor. The dead were laid on plywood planks organized by age and gender awaiting family members to claim their bodies. Survivors were ushered to hospitals all around the Indianapolis area and a barn was used as a temporary hospital. Numerous people and agencies were indicted for the incident, including the state fire marshal, Indianapolis fire chief, the gas supplier, the general manager, and concessions manager. In the end, only the gas supplier was convicted, but the conviction was overturned by the Indiana Supreme Court. A $4.6 million settlement was paid to the victims. Wow, this list was especially dark one for me. It was hard for me to read up about these events and their victims. Murder and disaster is a hard pill for any empathetic person to swallow. So I ask you all for one thing today. Please be kind to protect each other, and I do hope to see you all in the next video. Take care, guys.